Why we opened up the advocacy um, part or ring of the organization officially was um, in 2011, the NYPD was um, discriminating against the Muslim community in New York City and surveilling them. And um, we found out that the association was being surveilled, that many mosques and restaurants. How did, how did and you find this out? Well, these were all, the reports were coming out and they would have listed places uh, in that uh, Associated they would have, Press uh, yeah. when was they, revealing. Yeah, yeah, yeah they, they were leaking. They're these still online, reports. you can find them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. Uh -huh. I see. Yeah, that. and so it was, it mentioned like um, mosque names and people's names, activist mm -hmm. names and leaders and um, so people as well as places. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah. where they were, like at, the, at a wedding of someone um, that Abir was attending, for yes. example. <laughs> yeah, so and um, the pictures. You okay? Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so we, we found out that there were all these reports coming out, and um, there was a huge spike in advocacy around these reports, which were connecting everything that was happening. We knew that there were surveillance happening, we knew that people were being deported, we knew that people were getting picked up by the cops, so this was something that... Um, really very much meshed our like police reform work with like Islamophobia. And so we developed this wing to start working with the community and hire someone to do it full time um, to start working on these issues and advocating on these issues, but then also to really like uphold all the work that needs to be done, whether that was civic engagement, getting people out to vote, getting people mm -hmm. um, to the polls to like really like vote for people who would support um, us combating these issues. Um, getting um going on immigration coalitions officially you know like linda and many people who are working here were going to these meetings for years and years and years but we got to a certain um, point where we just didn't have the capacity to do it without somebody being hired to mm -hmm. do it and so um we were um over time building partnerships so we built partnerships with the new york immigration coalition um from the 2011 um, surveillance issue we built a partnership with communities united for police reform who because at the same time the the stop and frisk movement was happening and so stop and frisk mm -hmm, yeah so people were organizing around stop and frisk there was a lot of research and data that had come out at the same time 2011 2012 and so mm -hmm. and it was also like during occupied like this was mm -hmm. all happening at the at same, the same time. time and so all of these movements were starting to converge together and um, people were starting to build coalitions and so we started to officially join these coalitions so so we have a one which is the arab women activists and leaders which i um kind of had um and this is uh, mainly from when women in the community or women who are part of adult ed classes um and basically we do that we teach uh, women to have the right tools to organize mm -hmm. um to for example understand what consent means what are their rights here what are their kids rights in schools so we kind of do that uh, and in parallel to awal what i do which we forgot as ace is like we kind of go into adult ed classes and we give workshops. Mm. So, for example, know your right workshop. If the FBI shows up at your door, what do you do? If the NYPD stops you, what do you do? If, you know, et cetera, what do you do? Um, then also we have NYIC, which is the New York Immigration Coalition. I'm sure you've heard of them. They're um, you know, really well known in, in New York. Um, and then we have Fight for 15. Um, that, this is a very recent one that we joined. Take on Hate, the Abir kind of coordinates. Um, you know, we go into schools and give workshops, uh, this presentation that kind of um, inspires kids on how to talk about Islamophobia, but also how to work around, how to combat Islamophobia in a, in a very, um, I don't want to say politically correct, but like in a very sensitive way to um, to the community. And these uh, workshops are they like uh, in the afternoon or several days? Uh, or? Yeah. So the take on hate workshops, um, we try to coordinate them with public schools mostly, and mm -hmm. we'll go into those schools during the day. And mm -hmm. like usually, it, it will be like a social studies class or something that they're talking about that issue, and we'll come in. And it's like about an hour long workshop, which teaches them firstly to like what Islamophobia is, how to identify it. Then we do some like media clip images of Islamophobia mm -hmm. and I'll have them like dissect it and like kind of talk about the imagery, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Then we'll talk about Islamophobia in politics and the political rhetoric mm -hmm. in the United States. And then we go through different um, ways to combat it and different things that people have done. So for example, like this is a hashtag that people created at a certain point, right. um, or like this is, um, one town, like I think it was, there's some like European um, city that like somebody like vandalized a mosque, and so the the town like flower bombed the mosque, which like they basically got flowers yeah, and hearts, fun. and like you know they did that. So like we'll teach them these are ways that people kind of combat Islamophobia. 
Um, and the last one, um, well, the last before youth, um, is Community for Pol United for Police Reform. Um, and that's a coalition that we work on police reform. Um, but one recent thing we're working on is the Right to Know Act bill. I don't know if you know it. It's a bill that kind of comprises, or it's comprised of two things, which is kind of forcing the uh, NYPD officer to identify themselves mm. uh, before, uh, you know, doing anything with you. And it's normal, right? When you say hi, it's like I tell you who I am and who you are, and then we kind of can carry on. Mm -hmm. Um, and that avoids a lot of confusion with our community because oftentimes our community members are stopped. Uh, they don't know who stopped them, what happened, etc. Mm -hmm. And the second part of the Right to Know Act, which is just an example of what we're working on with Communities for Police Reform, um, is the uh, consent um, to search. Mm -hmm. So as um, the government now cannot enter our houses or search our cars, they need a warrant for that. Mm -hmm. they, they also need to get a, a, a consent, at least from us, to search our bodies and our pockets uh, mm -hmm. because often there's a lot of um, you know, uh, sexual um, uh, kind of harassment aspect of things where because of abuse of power, um, a lot of women in our community that cannot express themselves feel untouched in a way, feel touched in a way that is not welcome. Mm -hmm. um, and so having that in place will actually eliminate a lot of these unwanted um, touching, you know, of your body. And anyone in any community mm -hmm. would not want right. to be touched exactly. uh, without consent. I was going to say, that doesn't um, sound like something cultural. It sounds like something exactly, human. Exactly, yeah. right? And that's what we're trying to convince NYPD because they're very opposed to to the consent one. I'll just add that we have like one more thing, which is the Youth Racial Justice yes. Program, which is what I run um, with um, like the Interns and Volunteers of the Association, which is an after school program that um, for youth who want to get involved in organizing. And so what we first do is we do like um, um, train uh, we, we do like educational trainings and so we'll go through like the entire history or like racist history of the United States with them and talk about different groups and what has happened and so we start off with like indigenous Americans and then we uh, I was call them indigenous people I don't, yeah. in case they don't want to be called yeah. American right? yeah. and then and then we like go on um, and so like and then the youth will eventually start to organize un like under the coalitions that we work with and then these youth you know came on April 21st we had we had a big mm. rally day and we had a big lobby day uh, where um, actually members of 60 organizations came together and lobbied 40, 13 uh, because one of them canceled 13 council members on the same day um, and so people who never met each other you know people mm -hmm. from the Bronx from Harlem from right. Brooklyn from all Manhattan, the boroughs then everyone <laughs> came together for the first time ever and like for example Abir's youth met Ramarli Graham's brother and yeah. mother and they had just uh, taken a class with Abir about you know the unfortunate incidents you know what happened to Ramarli Graham's how he was killed etc right. and you could see in the youth's eyes you know how oh God, they, they looked, were so like touched yes <laughs> Um, you know, and this is exactly what we want to do, you know, connecting people, connecting communities, but also kind of igniting that curiosity in them that where actually they are really, really passionately involved and invested in the work. And do. this was done here or you chose a it space? Was, it was in the city. So we were lobbying city council. Yes, so, um, oh, okay. so we were um, at we city, were down hall. At city hall. City hall. We With had, like, all the other organizations. Very nice. Yeah, yeah. So it's a whole space for yes, congregating yes, among yes, organizations. Yes. Wonderful. Yeah.